Good evening, everybody. How's everyone doing tonight? Great, great, great. Wonderful. Let's go ahead and uh, find our way as we stand. And uh, welcome to Friendship with God Fellowship. It's so great to see so many faces here, so many smiling faces. Um, great to see so many people who are full from a great meal. And we're going to start off by singing a little bit tonight with this first hymn called His Way With Thee. Words are on the screen, or you can find them in your red hymnals. We're going to start off by singing here on the first, His Way With Thee. Here we go tonight on the first. Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him within the narrow road? Would you have him bear your burden, carry all your load? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see. Was best for him to have his way with thee. Would you have him make you free and follow at his call? Would you know the peace that comes by giving all? Would you have him save you so that you never fall? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you are to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see. T'was best for him to have his way with thee on the last. Would you in his kingdom find a place of constant rest? Would you prove him true in providential test? Would you in his service labor always at your best? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see was best for him to have his way with thee. Wonderful singing tonight. We're going to sing another one that is one of my personal favorites called People Need the Lord. And if you've never sung this, um, just an absolute beautiful melody, I think you'll enjoy it as well. We'll sing here on our second song tonight, People Need the Lord, here on the first verse. Every day they pass me by, I can see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with care, headed who knows where. On they go through private pain, living fear to fear. hides the silent cries only Jesus hears people need the Lord people need the Lord at the end of broken dreams he's the open again. Can we try that from the beginning and we'll sing the words on the screen? Not my words. Here we go on the second verse. We are called to take his light to a world where wrong seems right. What could be 
I skipped a line in that. That's not um, you. That was me. So thanks for singing great, even in spite of my shortcomings. One last song before our announcements. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. This was, for the longest time, my favorite hymn. And um, I still like it. I have a lot of favorites now, though. But this is one of my favorites. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. We'll sing this as our last hymn before the announcements. Here we go. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. singing tonight. You may be seated. At this time now, our announcements with Jason. Good evening, church family. Glad you could join us this evening. Happy Rosh Hashanah to those Jewish folks and friends that are celebrating the new year, and also happy Feast of Trumpets. We have a trumpet up here. We'll, maybe we'll blow that a little later, but um, glad you could join us tonight. Uh, do we have any new folks visiting us tonight? Okay, well, welcome. We're glad you're here tonight. We'll hand out a new visitor card to you. Please fill that out, and we'd like to get to know you a little bit better. You can fill out your information, and if you have any prayer requests, you can put that on the back, and uh, we'd love to pray for you. 
We also have prayer available up here uh, with our staff after the service. If anyone would like prayer, come on up, and uh, we'd love to pray with you. Please uh, open up your uh, bulletin now as we go through some announcements. So grateful for our food ministry. Thank you for the potato bar this evening. That was delicious. And uh, next week, we have some amazing Jewish food lined up for you. There's so many different things on there. Um, I can't even say those words, but it's all Israeli food. Um, Come next week, 4.30 p.m., uh, we'll have some great fellowship. It's our Yom Kippur uh, celebration, and actually, Yom Kippur, you're supposed to fast, so we're going to load you up with food, and then you're going to fast after that, so, um, but just uh, come next week. We're going to have some great time in our tabernacle theater. Actually, dinner will be served in here on this side, and then uh, you'll head over to the tabernacle theater, and that's where we'll do our, our service, so please join us next week. That starts at 4.30 p.m. Invite your friend. There's a flyer in your bulletin, so you could take your flyer out to, your, to a friend or family member. And then uh, we also have our Friday night women's Bible study coming up, September 14th. Please uh, go see Judy. If you, have more information, if you need more information, go talk to her. She's also trying to put together some rides. If anybody needs a ride uh, or can give a ride, uh, uh, there's some folks that need some transportation. Please see her and talk to her about that. And we would appreciate that. And then we also have our Friendship of God Church anniversary coming up September 30th. So come and celebrate that with us. And finally, our Learn Basic Hebrew classes. That starts uh, October 11th uh, with Lita Hill. She's a, an amazing teacher. Don't want to miss out on that. If you can um, come and, and just learn. And it's, it'll really help you uh, with your Jewish friends or even to look, looking in the scriptures and seeing how uh, the Hebrew is written. Um, she's going to be doing more historical type teaching, so it'll be a really great class, and that'll be here 6.30 p.m. on Thursday evenings right here in this, this uh, class right here. So that's all I have for announcements. Uh, we're going to go ahead and continue to worship the Lord through our giving. Uh, we don't pass the plate here, but if you'd like to drop your tithe right down the hall, we have a box, so please uh, go ahead and do that. And we're going to go ahead and pray now for the rest of the evening. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, uh, for this day, Lord. We thank you for, um, for the holiday, a Feast of Trumpets, Lord, and what that means. And, and Lord, your return will be soon someday, Lord, and we will hear those trumpets, Lord. And uh, it's, it's a great thing to uh, celebrate that and to get ready, get prepared for that day that you will return for us. And we are just so grateful for this, uh, this place, Lord. Thank you so much for uh, Mr. Canner and the message tonight. Please uh, speak through him. Uh, just uh, allow us to, to, to uh, use that, uh, what we're learned tonight, to apply it to our lives and to, um, to use it to equip others and also to teach others, Lord, about your word. We want to know more about you and, and grow deeper in the word, Lord. And I pray that you would just uh, continue to bless the rest of the service tonight. Uh, we're so grateful to be here. And uh, thank you so much for all the, the, um, the blessings you've given us. We want to also... Um, uh, we want you to multiply the, the gifts that are brought forth t- uh, this evening, Lord. We pray that you would help us to have wisdom on how to use those. We pray that to further your kingdom, Lord, and that you would just uh, be honored through everything that we do here uh, in this uh, outreach in this church, Lord. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jason. Um, we're going to sing our last hymn tonight before the preaching, and I thought it was fitting, uh, this song talking about being a friend of God and uh, the promises, the promise that God gave Abraham. And um, tonight we're going to sing about standing on the promises as we're sitting down, or as you're sitting down. So uh, we'll sing one last time. You know, I would like to just say one quick thing. Um, I like to wear, well, I, I, like, I like exotic jewelry. I like jewelry that has a little bit different from the from the norm and um and i like wearing jewelry a little bit and uh i like wearing jewelry that has meaning or significance or something personal to the person who's wearing it and to me since i'm wearing it and i i normally wear a bracelet like this it's one of two and the bracelet is representative there's an organization a christian organization that makes jewelry and this one talks about the promise that god gave abraham um about how he would be a father to many nations to many people and uh And so I wear this, and it's kind of a reminder of God's faithfulness to his promises. 
And tonight as we sing about standing on the promises, I'd like you to take this away with you maybe in the week, something that you can remind yourself with, maybe even on your phone, a little daily reminder, a little note that you write yourself, something maybe on your screensaver about God's promises that he's given you, that he's written in his word for you. And we're going to sing this last hymn and then the preaching of Standing on the Promises here tonight on the first. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing. Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God on the last. Standing on the promises I cannot fail. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Great singing tonight. At this time, we are going to dismiss our children with our children's church and get ready for our speaker now with Mr. Tom Cannon. Great. Well, standing on the promises, that's better than sitting on the premises, isn't it? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, well, uh, Happy New Year, Lashonot Tovah, to everybody here. Today, this is uh, the uh, year, the Jewish calendar year, 5,779. That's the year, in case you didn't know. And uh, the Chinese New Year is around 4,600. What that means, basically, is that for 1,179 years, about, Jewish people had to do their own laundry. So that's what that means. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so <laughs> I hope the message is better. <laughs> All right, so, okay. So <clears throat> if you turn, please, in your Bible to Genesis chapter 22, we're going to uh, continue in, uh, in, in one of the most remarkable histories or accounts in the Bible, which is the test of God's friend. Um, so let's, uh, first of all, let's pray. Father, thank you. Father, we have just feel tonight like we should call you friend. Friend, thank you for, Lord, recording this remarkable event in, your, in the life of your friend and how you tested your friend. And help us, Lord, to, to learn tonight all that you want to teach us from this passage in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Genesis 22, verse 1. Genesis 22, verse 1, and it came to pass that after these things that Abraham, that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am, here, I'm, here I am, and he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went, both of them together. Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together. They came to the place which God had told them of. Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, bound Isaac his son, laid him on the altar upon the wood. Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Okay, now in these scriptures, in this passage here that we've been, we've been following along, it's really a, a, a passage here that's full of feeling. And we've been feeling, we've been feeling along with Abraham the, 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 the shock when God asked Abraham in, in verse 2, take now thy son, thy only son, and then he said, and offer him there. And then we felt Abraham's feeling of loss, this like emptiness, when God really pointed out, this is your only son, thine only son in verse 2. We felt the pain that Abraham felt when God further went on in verse 2 and says, oh, I am talking about Isaac, whom thou lovest. And then we've been feeling as, with all of this, Abraham's resolve that he's going to obey God in verse 3 when it said Abraham rose up early in the morning. And we understood why Abraham didn't go to anyone else and say, um, you know, God told me to sacrifice Isaac. What do you think? But, but, and, they, and in that way, Abraham was just like Peter and the apostles in Acts, uh, in Acts 5.29, Acts 5.29, where it says, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And we also felt Abraham's heart, as his own heart, would be speaking to him, don't do this, and wanting to go his own way. And we felt that Abraham said no to his heart that was like Isaiah 53, 6. Isaiah 53, 6, which says, all we like sheep have gone, uh, have have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And also the passage in Jeremiah 17, 9, commenting on our heart, commenting on Abraham's heart in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And we felt Abraham's trust. We felt Abraham's trust and his conviction, his assurance. God is going to raise my son Isaac from the dead, right out of those ashes, as we saw him in verse 5, when Abraham told the young men that were with him, verse 5, I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. I and the lad will come again to you. And it was not just Abraham's feelings through all this that we felt in this chapter. We also felt Isaac's feelings as he began to realize he was going to be the sacrifice which he did when he saw everything for the sacrifice had been taken, but no lamb. No lamb was taken. And before even asking the question that we're going to consider here tonight, before even asking that question, Isaac knew. Isaac knew that he was going to be the sacrifice. And, and Isaac knew that there was no lamb. And Isaac knew that he was given the wood to carry up there that was going to burn him. As it says in verse 6, verse 6, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And at that moment, 
We felt the crisis of decision that Isaac had to make as to whether he's going to agree to be the sacrifice or not agree. And so then we saw that without any words at all, as Isaac looked at Abraham, he looked into the, the eyes of Abraham, and Abraham looked into the, 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 the uh, looked back into the eyes of Isaac, and Isaac looking into the eyes of his loving father without any words, he says, Really? Does it have to be this way? Must it be that I must die to be the sacrifice for God to God? Is there any other way? Is there any other way? And then Abraham replies also without any words, but just used his eyes, the eyes of a loving father who speaks silently back as he looked into the eyes of his son and in, in essence said without words, yes, yes, my son, it must be. You must be the sacrifice to God. You must be the burnt offering to God. There is no other way. And there was more that Abraham expressed with his eyes to Isaac, as he said, without any words, as he said, it, 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 he said, in essence, without speaking, he said, I don't know. I don't know why God has asked for you to be the sacrifice. But there's been many things in life that God has asked me to do, and I don't know why, and I didn't know why. But one thing I know, and that is that God is good, and it's worth it to just trust God and just don't doubt and as Abraham looked into the eyes of Isaac, and his eyes carried this message to Isaac, and, 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 he, and he, he, he could see it in his face, and as he, and in essence said, my son, all my hopes for God's promise, we've just been singing, standing on the promises, all my hopes for God's promises, for me to grow to be a great seed, they're all centered in you, my son, and I know that in the end, you will not be left dead. Because God's going to raise you up to the dead because ashes don't generate seed. And you're going to become, you're going to be, you're going to be raised out so that my seed can become great because God promised that. So all this communication is going on, is taking place between Abraham and Isaac. And Isaac is reading this assurance from his father that all would be okay if they just obeyed God. And this really came down to a very simple, same question that's true for all the trials that, that we ever go through, anybody goes through, and that was the same for Isaac and same for Abraham. And really, it's just one question. Do I really believe in the goodness of God? Do I really believe that God wants good? He wants good for me. Do I believe that? Or do I believe, do I believe what the devil said to Eve? Way back in the garden with the first temptation in Genesis 3, 4. In Genesis 3, 4, when it says, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Oh, God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be open. You'll be as gods, knowing good and evil. So way back then, in the Garden of Eden, the decision to obey or sin, it all came down to one simple question. Was God really good or not? Was God really bad? Was he really keeping good knowledge from Eve so that her eyes could be open and she would know what's really good for her to know? What, or was God really bad in keeping, keeping her in the dark from what would be good for her to know? And that same question has just never changed, come down through the ages. God says that to all virgins. You know, it's good for them. It's good for you to know sexual union before you get married. The same question comes out, is God really bad? Is he keeping this good pleasure from me? Is he really bad? Is he keeping me in the dark about sexual knowledge? And that was the same question that faced Eve about eating the forbidden fruit, and she decided to believe the devil, and she concluded that, it was, that he was right. Why? Because it was hard for her. It was hard for her to see that beautiful fruit and to think that it was good to eat and make one wise and that, and, and that God was bad to forbid her to eat such a wonderful fruit. And that's the same decision that goes on today where, 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 uh, with regard to sexual activity. And that basic core question of the goodness of God, it was on the table there for Abraham and Isaac there. Was God really bad or really good to require that Isaac be sacrificed? It was really hard for Abraham. It was hard for Abraham to look at his son and to think that he must be the one to, to take Isaac's life and to make him a burnt offering. 
As, as one parent came, came up to me after the service last Sunday, Sunday and said that she couldn't imagine sacrificing her son. And it was really hard for Abraham. It was really hard for Isaac. It was hard for Isaac to look at his young life and to think he must be, be, he must be the sacrifice. He must die. He must be the burnt offering. And I was thinking, you know, uh, as I was thinking about this, it reminded me of a dear believer that, 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 that his name was Temeskin. Got really close to Temeskin, an uh, Ethiopian. He was 12 years old. When he developed, he was 12 years old, when he developed osteosarcoma in his right leg. He was living in a mud hut, not very far from where we are in Ethiopia, one mountain over. He was living in a mud hut in Ethiopia and, 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 and uh, when, when this happened, as a matter of fact, I remember him t- he t- trying to explain to me one time how he got to his village as opposed to where, where our Scandabai's compound is located in Ethiopia. He says, well, you know, when you go outside of, of, of Addis, that, 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 that place where they sell the donkeys, he said, you go that way, and you go instead of going that way. But anyways, that's where he was down there. Anyway, so he got this osteosarcoma, big, huge tumor on his leg. They, and the people said, you know, you, you, you got to go to Addis Ababa. You know, to, to. And so he gets to Addis Ababa, and a lot of drama, and he goes to the general hospital there, and they say, well, that's cancer, and you know, unless you have, that, unless you have your leg amputated off, you're going to die. And we only have two, uh, two, two, uh, two, two uh, bone surgeons here in, in Ethiopia for 85 million people. And uh, they're all booked up for over a year, and you're going to die in nine months, and it's really expensive to transport a dead corpse back to your village. So if you don't mind, just please go back to your village and die there. And so, you know, everybody, but he trusted God. And everybody was crying, but he trusted God. And then, and then they, they, they said, uh, well, wait a minute. They said, uh, we've heard that the Mother Teresa Hospital over there in, in, uh, in, in another place, and we'll go over there. So they went over there to the Mother Teresa Hospital, which mainly has cancer patients, and they have a ward there of about 40 uh, uh, young kids with cancer. I had, I had a privilege one time of, of speaking to them all. And anyway, so he was in this ward there with all these kids with cancer, and they were all looking at his big, huge lump on his leg, and, and, he, and he made friends with another fellow named Mohammed who had the same osteosarcoma, and he, and he had his leg, left leg amputated. And so a doctor comes along, and, 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 and he says, uh, he, he says uh, you know, I've never done an amputation before, but he said, I'll give it a try. And, and he amputated Temeskin's right leg at the hip. And, and, then, uh, and then he and Mohammed became good friends, and they used to go down to the Mercato there, the, uh, the, the market, and they, and, they used to buy, and they used to come back so proud that they could buy one pair of shoes. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and, then, and then what happened was Temeskin, how I got to know him, is Temeskin was adopted by my attorney, Mary Louise Cohen, in, in Washington, D.C., and that's when I met Temeskin, and as soon as he learned English, we became friends, close friends. And because he was a believer in all the conversations, Temeskin, you've been adopted into a Jewish family, and let me tell you what that means. And I says, you know, they don't, they don't believe in Christ. And all I remember so much is innocent eyes. Why? Anyway, uh, we had a lot of discussion. I told him, I said, I'll tell you why. He said, I don't know. But... <clears throat> But, 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 but Temeskin was just amazed to have come from this extreme poverty in a mud hut to wealth, living in a multi-million dollar house uh, uh, on, uh, on Military Avenue in, in Washington, D.C., and, and, going to, and getting things like an iPod and a watch you know, and, 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 and having, a, having a closet full of clothes. Yeah, he had a closet. He has a closet of clothes in Ethiopia, and they happen to be on his back. That's the only clothes he had. But then all of a sudden, he's there, and he's learning all these things. He's going to a school, that, a high school, that costs $40,000 a year in tuition. And he's just like learning things and seeing things he's never seen before. And, 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 and for the first time in his life, he'd never happened to him before, he saw the ocean. Ethiopia's landlocked. He saw the ocean, and he caught a fish. <laughs> caught a fish. Ethiopians don't eat fish. And they caught a fish, you know, and, and, and that was just wonderful. And he swam in the ocean for the first time. He became a good swimmer with one leg. And, 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 he, and he saw snow for the first time, and he played in it, and, and he got to ride a horse for the first time. And, 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 and everything was just, 
just fantastic with him. And, and it was just such a wonderful thing as he was discovering one thing after another. It was like a kid that was being born. And then he, 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 he um, and so I taught Temeskin some hymns in English. And then he, he said, well, I don't have any. So he began to write hymns in Amharic, in the Ethiopian language. And then he got a guitar, and he, and, he, and he learned to play the guitar. And he loved to play the guitar. And he played the guitar for me and, 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 and tell me to sing his songs and teach, tell me what they meant. And, and, uh, and, and then he began to explain to me that back in his church, back in Ethiopia, they didn't have any musical instruments. They didn't have any hymns. They had no, no music, no songs to praise God, no musical instrument. That's why he got a guitar, and he wrote hymns, and he told me the words of the hymns, which were all about the greatness of God and the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and of course, now he has glasses on, but he had beautiful eyes that would sparkle with delight as he told me how he couldn't wait to, to get his education over with in that $40,000 a year school, and then he was going to return to his church back in Ethiopia with his guitar and his hymns, and he was going to teach the church how to sing hymns of praise to God. And, it was, and, 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 and we got close, and, and, and like Jonathan and David close, and, and, but, and everything was going great, but Temeskin's cancer came back. And Mary Louise and Bruce Cohen, they did everything for him. They took Temeskin to the best cancer centers in the U.S. They took him to the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, to the George Washington University Cancer Center, to St. Jude's, and his cancer would not stop. And as they gave Temeskin super high doses of methotrexate chemotherapy, Temeskin told me he couldn't take it any longer. And when they would come into his hospital room to give him more methotrexate, he would pull the covers over his face. And they would still give it to him until finally he locked himself in the bathroom in the hospital and he would yell, no, no. And so it was decided, okay, no more chemo. And Temeskin was glad. And they cleaned up Temeskin's port in his, his chest and showed him how to keep it sterile and told him that, you, Temeskin, you can make one last trip now back to Ethiopia. And, 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 and he asked his oncologist, would she go to Ethiopia with him and his cancer nurse? at George Washington University Hospital, and they did. And they all went back. It was a big entourage of people that went to Ethiopia, and, and, and then he asked me, would I go to Ethiopia? Well, I've got to be honest with you. At first, you know, I said, Ethiopia? I don't know. No, I don't think Ethiopia. No. But then he said, uh, Bruce Cohen is going. Bruce is Jewish, and Mary Louise is not. Bruce Cohen, I always wanted to get to know Bruce because he was the chief legal advisor for P Patrick Leahy. At that time, the Democrats had the, had the Senate. Patrick Leahy he was in charge of the Judicial Committee. <clears throat> so, 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 and he was never home working. I always wanted to get to know Bruce. So he said, Bruce is going, Bruce? I said, I'll go. I don't care if it's Antarctica, I'll go. So I said, yes. It was my first trip to Ethiopia in 2007. And Temeskin, uh, when we were there, Temeskin looked at me and he said, would you bring the gospel to my people? And, 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 uh, and, 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 um, and it was hard for Temeskin. I remember he opened up his English Bible and he read this passage to me in Joshua 1.3. He says, you know, if you come back here to Ethiopia, he said, Joshua 1.3, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. And Temeskin told me that, you know, when, I, when, when, you, when you come back, come back to Ethiopia, and every step that you take in Ethiopia, I want you just to repeat those words, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given you. And I looked at Temeskin as those eyes and I I told him, yes, I would. And, 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 and that's why we have a company in Ethiopia, uh, because I made a promise to my little buddy, Ethi my little Ethiopian buddy, Temeskin, and, and, uh, and I also realized, as you, as you heard from that young missionary mother in the Nairobi airport, that God asked me to. And, and then it was, and so it was going on, and it was very, very clear that Temeskin was going to die. And so I began to try to speak to my friend, uh, Temeskin, about heaven. And when I'd, when I'd start to talk about heaven, Temeskin would stop me, and he would say, no, I'm not going to die. He said, I'm just 15 years old, and I'm just beginning my life for God. And I have not gone back to my church in Ethiopia. I need to teach them my hymns and play my guitar for them. Don't talk to me about dying. I'm not going to die, because God's going to heal me. I've seen him heal other people. And Temeskin, and he, he, he had these reports of other pe people getting healed, and he used to keep them and read them and reread them. 
and, 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 and Temeskin changed his whole view of the Bible. He'd get all excited and he'd tell you, Tom, Tom, do you know what Jesus did? How he healed this person when he was blind and he healed that person. It was really hard for Temeskin to even think that he was going to die. And so I bought him a book. I bought him a 500-page book on heaven. And I said, here, Temeskin. He refused to open it. And, and, and I didn't know what to do. And I was sitting there struggling, and I, and I, and I think, I need to prepare my little friend to die. So, so I told Temeskin, I said, Temeskin, I said, I want you to think. I want you to think now about your life. I want you to think really hard about how you were very, very, very poor, living in a mud hut. And I want you to think about how you became very, very, very sick with cancer. And I want you to think about how someone very, very, very rich and wonderful, Mary Louise Cohen, came to you and adopted you. And, and, and I want you to think about how she took you very, very far away from your old home in Ethiopia and to your new home in Washington, D.C., and I want you to think how wonderful it was. I want you to think about the sights that you never, ever, ever saw before, like the ocean and the snow, and it was wonderful. And I want, to think, I want you to think about the wonderful things that you did. You went fishing. You swam in the ocean. You, you, you played in the snow. And then I, and, and then I said, Temeskin, it's going to be a repeat of the history. That's all. I said, it's all going to repeat again. You think that now in Washington, D.C., you're very, very rich now? You actually are very, very poor, like before. And that cancer that made you very sick, it's come back. And again, it's made you very, very sick again. And just like before, someone very, very rich and wonderful, the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to come for you. And just like before, he's going to adopt you. And like before, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to take you very, very far away from your home in, on earth to a new home in heaven. It's going to be wonderful there. And just like before, you're going to see things in heaven that you never, ever saw before. And that's going to be wonderful. And just like before, you're going to do things that you never, ever did before. And it'll be wonderful. And, and, and as I said all that, I thought to myself, as I said to it, that was really good. <laughs> I thought, that was great. As a matter of fact, I kind of sat there and I was kind of marveling about how, wow, where'd that come from? I was thinking about it. And I looked at Temeskin, I said, wasn't that great, Temeskin? He just glared at me. <laughs> no, I told you I'm not going to die. He didn't agree. You know why he said that? You know why he said that? You know why he refused to hear one word that I said? Because it was really hard for Temeskin to accept that he was going to die. And that's how Isaac felt at this time. It was really hard for Isaac to accept that he was going to die. And just like Temeskin, who was dying at the age of 15 and did, Isaac thought that he's too young to die. Just like Temeskin, who thought that he couldn't die now because he was just beginning his life for God, that was Isaac. Isaac thought that he's just beginning his life for God, just like Temeskin, who had plans to play his guitar and to teach his poor church in Ethiopia all the hymns that he wrote. Isaac thought, I have plans. I have plans to get married and to have a family for God, just like my father did. It was really hard for Isaac to accept that he was going to die. So in verse 6, without any words exchanged, Isaac realizes he's the sacrifice. He's going to die. And we can imagine how at the end of verse 6, when Isaac had that wood in his hands, and Abraham, you know, Abraham with two hands, one hand, he had a knife, he had a knife, and the other hand, he had fire in his hand. And we can imagine how Isaac stopped on their way there, when it kind of all came into, I'm going to die, I'm the sacrifice. And he stops, and Abraham stops, and Abraham waits for Isaac to make his decision, and then Isaac made his decision to go. And the Bible describes that decision, that silent decision that was made at the end of verse 6 with those simple, beautiful words, and they went, both of them, together. They went, both of them, yachad, having become united. And they walked off toward Mount Moriah. Abraham decided to sacrifice his son, his only son whom he loved, Isaac walked off toward Mount Moriah, decided to be the burnt offering sacrifice. And from that picture, we see, we understand how the heavenly father, how, how, how the heavenly Abraham, God the Father, moved in history 
toward Mount Calvary where he would sacrifice his son, decided. And from that picture, we see and understand how the heavenly Isaac, the Lord Jesus Christ, moved in history toward Mount Calvary, decided that he would be the sacrifice. And the beauty of that scene is expressed in that one word, yachad, shnayim yachad. The two had become united in their decision. For Abraham and Isaac, the decision was for Isaac to become the sacrifice. And verse 6 means when it says they all, both of them went together, that was it. For God the Father and God the Son, the decision for the Lord Jesus Christ to become the sacrifice for you and me was they went both of them, yachad, together. And for all eternity, we're going to be marveling over verse 6. How God the Father and God the Son went both of them together on their way to Mount Calvary where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners were slain, where, where he devoted that sacred head for sinners, for, for, for a worm as I, for such a worm as I. So in verse 7, there's a pause with Isaac, and, I, and then Isaac speaks. He speaks in verse 7. Isaac spake unto his father, Abraham, unto his, Abraham his father, and said, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? Isaac already knows. He really already knows from that silent language between him and his father. But now Isaac wants to break the silence and just have some communication with words. So Isaac pauses and he speaks. And at first, he just wants an assurance of their relationship together. Nothing's changed. So he doesn't call him father. He doesn't say Abba. He doesn't do that, but he calls out with a possession, my father, Avi. He says, Avi. Reminds me of a dinner we had, um, actually, last Friday night, where Lori, Lori Cable was, uh, was there with one of her 10 children, and it was her daughter, and, um, and she was just sitting there, and she, and she was just rubbing the hand very lovingly of her daughter and sent a message. So Isaac calls Abraham, Avi, my father, very loving way, very tender in this, he calls, he calls, he says to Abraham, my father. And again, and again, we feel this tenderness that Isaac had in his heart when he calls, he calls Abraham, my father. And Abraham is so quick to respond. Abraham doesn't just say what he said to God. He nanny, behold me. He, but Abraham returns with all that love and affection from being called my father. And, and he says, he nanny vni. He says, he says he, here am I, my son. Behold me, my son. And, and now that there's an assurance that the love hasn't changed, that nothing has changed in that bond of mutual love between the devotion between Abraham and Isaac, Isaac now opens up his heart and, 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 he, and he reveals the anxiety and he, he just wants to hear it verbally, just to make sure that he, has, he hasn't misunderstood or misread the obvious. So Isaac asks this question of the obvious, obvious when he says, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And with that question, we can see Isaac first looking at Abraham's one hand. And what does he see? He sees the fire. And then, and, 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 and he sees the fire, and he knows that's the fire that's going to ignite the wood that's going to burn up my body. And, and, and he looks at the wood in his arms, and, and he knows that this is the wood that will be ignited by the fire that will burn up my body. But Abraham has something else in his other hand, and it's the knife. And we can see Isaac, he looks at the knife, and he sees what's going to be used there to, 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 to kill him. And, and, and as he does that, he, 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 he just he thinks, that's the knife that's going to be plunged into my heart and cut my throat. And when Isaac sees the knife, he just turns away. He can't bear it. He turns away. He can't bear to mention it. That's the instrument that's going to kill him. And he turns away from the thought of the pain of dying he can't bear to think about what, 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 what it's going to feel like, that cold steel blade plunging into his chest. And so we can see Isaac here turning away from the knife that's going to cause the pain. So in verse 7, Isaac doesn't say, behold the knife and the fire and the wood. Oh, Isaac can talk about the fire. Isaac can talk about the wood because at that point he knows he's going to be already dead and he's going to feel nothing when the fire burns up his body. But Isaac has never died before. Isaac's never felt a knife stabbing him in his heart, a, a knife across his throat. It's too much for Isaac to even think about it, so he just avoids mentioning the knife at all. And we can feel the terror that Isaac is feeling as he looks at the knife, and we can understand what, that I, why Isaac doesn't talk about the knife 
in verse 7, it's just too much. It's not that he's not thinking about the knife and the pain that he'll experience with the death with no morphine, but he's, he, but he's thinking a lot about it. He just doesn't want to talk about it right now. But the Lord Jesus also thought a lot about the pain that he would suffer as he was put to death. And the Lord Jesus did talk about that terrible death that he would suffer when he said to his disciples in Matthew 16, 21, Matthew 16, 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. In Luke 18, 31, Luke 18, 31, then he took unto them the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished, for he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and he shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spit it on, and they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And when Isaac looked at that knife, he just couldn't talk about it. And Isaac felt the pain, but he couldn't talk about it. When the Lord Jesus spoke about, about being mocked, the Lord Jesus felt the pain of being mocked. And when the Lord Jesus spoke about being spit on, the Lord Jesus felt the spit in his face, as it says in Isaiah 50, verse 6. Isaiah 50, verse 6, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair, and I hid not my face from shame and spitting. And when the Lord Jesus spoke about being scourged, he felt the Roman whip that was going to tear the flesh off of his body and leave his muscles exposed in a bloody pulp. And when the Lord Jesus spoke about being put to death, he felt the nails of the cross being driven through his hands and his feet. And when he spoke about all of his sufferings, he felt it all. He felt the terror. He felt the pain of dying as the sacrifice. And when Isaac looked and, and saw the knife, he refused to mention it. Isaac felt it all. He felt the terror and the pain. And he just wants a confirmation that he already knows that he is really going to be the sacrifice. And so he says, he says his question in verse 7, where's the lamb? And with that question that Isaac asked, he doesn't even know. He has asked the great question that will be prophetic for his people, the Jewish people, for thousands of years. We are in the year 5,779 today, in Rosh Hashanah. He asked the question that every seeking Jewish person will ever ask if they're going to find God's salvation, God's Yeshua, God's Jesus. And many Jewish people today, they, 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 have, they feel, I have everything, and I don't have the lamb, it's okay. For many Jewish people to have the religion of Judaism without the lamb for a burnt offering, it's fine. To have all the Jewish ceremonies, the Jewish holidays of the new year today, Rosh Hashanah, and without the lamb is fine. There's no question like Isaac's today for most Jews on Rosh Hashanah. For, you know, for today on Rosh Hashanah, it's behold the, the trumpet, behold the shofar, behold the apples and the honey, behold the time of reflection, behold the time of, uh, of repentance, behold the vow to be a better person for the next year. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? That question is not asked by the majority. But among the Jewish people, there is a minority called the remnant, who like Isaac will ask that question. Behold everything on Rosh Hashanah, but where is the lamb for my sins? And most Jews today on Rosh Hashanah do not ask Isaac's question, but the minority, the remnant do. And they ask, where is the lamb? It's not enough. And when they ask that question, they find John 1, 29, behold the lamb, which takes away the sin of the world, the Lord Jesus. Most Jewish people, Yom Kippur is coming up, as you see in your bulletin. Most people, most Jewish people will never ask Isaac's question on Yom Kippur, which is one week from this Wednesday. But it will be, they will never say, behold the synagogue, behold the prayer of repentance, with the beating of the chest and the saying, shlach li, shlach li, pardon me, pardon me for my sins. Behold the fasting from the food, and in my case, the water too, on the day of Yom Kippur. Behold the, 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 the prayer of promising to keep the vows for the following year, the kol nidre, kol is all, nidre is vows, kol nidre, all vows. Behold, here it all is, but they'll never say, where is the lamb? for the sacrifice for my sins. Most Jews on Yom Kippur do not ask Isaac's question, but the minority do, 
ask Isaac's question, and they say, here it all is, it's not enough. Where is the lamb for burnt offering? And then they find the John 1, 29, behold the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Passover! Most on Passover, never ask Isaac's question. Behold the Seder dinner. Behold the matzah. Behold the bitter herbs. Behold the egg. Behold the salt water. Behold the haroset, the honey. Behold the nuts mixture. Behold the horseradish. Behold the parsley. Behold the haggadah, the book, to guide us through all of this. Behold all the prayers. And, and, but where's the lamb for the sacrifice for the sins? Here it all is. Where's the blood that God said in Exodus 12, 13, when I see the blood, I will pass over. Where's the blood? And, and, and it, it reminds me of this last week, I was showing a friend of mine what, what the Passover Seder plate looks like. And when my friend saw this dried up shank bone on the plate, he said to me, what's that? And I said, sadly, that's what there is in place of the lamb. It's like hope that's dried up. So Isaac's question would be, behold the dried up shank bone, but where's the actual lamb? for the burnt offering. And most Jews on Passover, they don't ask Isaac's question, but the minority, the remnant, do. And they say, it's not enough. It's a lot, but it's not enough. Where is the lamb? And they find John 1, John 1, 29, the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So the question that Isaac has asked in verse 7 has continued to be asked to resound for the last 3,000 years. Where is the lamb? And the Bible clearly states in, Le in Le Leviticus 17, 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. It's the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Where is the blood of the lamb to make an atonement for my soul? And when most Jews hear, Isaac, most Jews hear Isaac's question of where is the lamb, they do one of two things. They either say, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care if there's a, that, that, whether there's a lamb. It has no relevance to me. I'm not looking for a lamb for my soul. I don't need a lamb for my soul. I'm just fine without a lamb for my soul. So please just leave me alone and don't ask me Isaac's question, where is the lamb? Or many Jews will say, well, I don't know. I'm going to go ask my rabbi. And so they go to their rabbi and they say to the rab rabbi, where's the lamb for my soul? And the rabbis will always give them the same answer. You don't need a lamb. Your prayers take the place of the lamb. They are the sacrifice. When you pray, it takes the place of the sacrifice, and that means you don't need a lamb. And if a Jewish person asked the rabbi, but my Christian friend told me that, that from Revelation 21, 27, that, it, that and there shall in no wise enter into anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. In other words, to heaven, they won't go in but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And my Christian friend told me that unless I have the Lamb for my soul, unless I'm written in the Lamb's book of life, I can't enter heaven. I'm going to be cast into hell. And the rabbis would say, hell is for the Gentiles, <laughs> not for the Jews. Jews don't get cast into hell. Only the Gentiles do. Because Jews are God's people by birth. So nothing to worry about as a Jew. You don't need a lamb. And most Jews will accept that. They'll accept what the rabbi says, and they'll no longer ask Isaac's question, except for the remnant, except the minority. And they will. They will say, I'm not satisfied with that. And they'll continue to ask, where is the lamb? And when they do, God said, I'll show you the lamb. And he brings them to John 1.29. Behold the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So if Isaac came to a Rosh Hashanah tonight, a Rosh Hashanah service, or a Yom Kippur service, or a Seder dinner, He'd look at all of this and he'd say, behold all these religious practices, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And that's the significance of the question in verse 7 that Isaac has, has asked. It's been asked for thousands of years. Where, where, where is the Savior who said in John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But Isaac wasn't thinking uh, uh, of how this question was going to be prophetic. He didn't know. For, for, and how it was going to be a challenge to all the Jewish people after him that would come from him who have religion without Christ. Isaac was wanting just a verbal confirmation that Abraham was going to give him. So he's got an open heart, he's got a loving gaze, and Isaac looks into his father who had never lied to him in the past, and he asked the question as if Isaac was saying, Father, I really already know the answer. I know the answer to the question. I, 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 I really feel like I shouldn't even be asking it. But just for a, a last confirmation, 
Can you just tell me verbally that I am the lamb for the burnt offering? Father, it's okay to tell me. It's okay to tell me I'm the lamb because, Father, I'm yachad. I'm yachad with you. You and I are yachad. We're, we became united. We became united together. My heart is it, it's just a little fluttering right now. And, and I just want to hear it from you, that, that you and I are really on the same page. I just want to know that just I'm the lamb for the burnt offering. So please, Father, just tell me that I'm the lamb for the burnt offering. And now you can imagine the bind that this puts Abraham in. What was Abraham going to say to his son? I mean, Abraham feels all the pressure of a loving son who loves him with all of his heart. And we can see Abraham looking to God, looking to the God of his salvation, the God of his life, and asking God, Lord, my son Isaac has just asked where the lamb is. Lord, Isaac has talked about the fire and the wood that's going to burn up his body. But he's avoided talking about the knife that's going to bring him all the pain. Lord, my son Isaac is really asking for a confirmation that he really is the lamb for the burnt offering. Lord, I need an instantaneous answer right now from your spirit because I just don't know what to say. And at that moment, Abraham was talking to Jehovah Jesus. And, and, and later on, Jehovah Jesus is going to say in John 15, 5, John 15, 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And at that moment, Abraham was looking to Jehovah Jesus to be Abraham's vine and, 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 and to bring Abraham. And Abraham felt like a pretty far-reaching branch way out there on the end there. And he's saying, and he's saying to, to God, I need a shot, a quick shot of some wisdom and the right words. And I'm a branch way out there right now. And I'm asking you as the vine, send the right words to me. Send the right words to me, because right now my gas tank is pegging out on empty. And, and, and Abraham, the branch, is feeling like he's just way out there, pretty far from the vine. And Abraham needs to support. He needed help. And Jehovah Jesus, the vine, heard that instant prayer of, of, of Abraham, the branch. And, and like the nutrients flow into a, uh, from a vine to a branch, this shot to him with these words that he should answer with what wisdom it has the marks of divinity all over it, what Abraham said. And, it's just, and, and the answer makes us marvel. The answer, the answer makes Isaac marvel. It makes us marvel. It, the reason is, the reason we all marvel is because Abraham's answer is it, because it comes obviously from the vine. Not from Abraham, but from the vine. And it comes, it comes to him just like the Lord Jesus said about what's going to happen when you're in a bind and you need to know what to say and you don't know what to say. In Mark 10, 18, Mark 10, 18, you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall, what you shall speak. It's not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. And that was Abraham's great answer. Be continued. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Canner. To be continued. Um, wonderful message tonight and a powerful testimony about his friend from Ethiopia. Um, just the reminder of how short life is and how unpredictable things can be sometimes um, and how grateful we should be for each and every day. Uh, tonight, we're going to sing one last hymn. And it is, no one ever cared for me. And the chorus says, like Jesus. And so um, we're going to sing this last hymn, if you wouldn't mind standing. And we'll sing this one hymn and then be dismissed. And, uh, you know, if you're Abraham, it must have been a little bit difficult as for at first walking up the mountain thinking, um, you know, I'm going to trust your promises, God. But are you doing this? Because you love me, do you care for? Do you care about my son Isaac? You know, and uh, everything that God puts us through is not out of spite. It's not out of anger, hatred, or discipline. It's, it's not to, it's not to say I don't love you. Everything He does is out of love, and um, to know that, to know that God is love, and He says I care for you. 
That's a, that's a wonderful thought. We're going to finish with that. Even when it seems like what he's asking of us is difficult, um, he says, I, I care for you, and you can trust that. And we're going to sing this last hymn, and then um, be dismissed. And if you'd like to blow the trumpet, they're not mine, so um, you'd have to. Who's, whose trumpets are these? Are these Jeff's? Yeah, maybe we can have Jeff blow them after the service. Uh, we're going to sing one last hymn, be dismissed, and thank you for coming again to church and joining us live online here tonight. Here we go on the first of No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus Since I found in Him a friend so strong and true I would tell you how He changed my life completely He did something that no other friend could do no one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms around me, and he led me in the way I ought to go. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. On the last, every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love. But I'll never know just why he came to save me. Till someday I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. Amen. Thanks for coming to church tonight. Turn to your neighbor, say a kind word. Um, and if you'd like prayer, go ahead and come on up front. And we would love to pray for you tonight. Drive safe, take care. God bless. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.